um, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to uh, to the uh, Try a Family Topics in Rehabilitation Sciences lecture series. And we have it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Aaron Wong, who's the um, director of the Cognitive Motor Learning Lab here at the Institute, and also the scientific director of the Klein Family Parkinson's Rehabilitation Center at Moss Rehab. Um, a little background on Dr. Wong, and many of you hardly needs any introduction, but Dr. Wong uh, studied uh, biomedical engineering as an undergraduate at University of Southern California, and uh, then went on to receive both uh, his PhD as well as a, a postdoctoral training period at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Um, and his work has made a number of significant contributions to the field of human motor control and motor learning. Um, and his research has studied both the intact nervous system as well as uh, neurological conditions. Um, and his understanding of the biological circuitry uh, in human motor control and together with his engineering and computational science background gives a really strong uh, position to be able to study behavior in Parkinson's disease. Um, so Dr. Wong has co-led the, uh, the Parkinson's Decline Family Parkinson's um, Rehabilitation Center, as I said, and that's since 2018, and um, and that's really grown over that time, and uh, and has was recently refunded, um, thanks to the prior success and the terrific outlook and the generosity of uh, the donors, um, and has provided growing momentum for both Parkinson's disease clinical rehabilitation as well as scientific studies. Uh, here uh, at Moss. So uh, welcome again. Thank you very much for presenting today, uh, Dr. Wong. And you have a very pr provocative title. Uh, it was, what do we really know about Parkinson's disease? So thank you. Take it away. Thank you, Dylan, for that kind introduction. Uh, let me share my screen here. All right. Um, so hopefully you should be able to see that. Um, and as Dylan mentioned, I sort of gave this an intentionally provocative title. <laughs> um, but mostly because I think you know, we really need to think a bit more critically about some of the assumptions that we think we know about um, many disorders, including Parkinson's disease in particular. Um, and, and really kind of, um, in order to make progress in understanding of how the brain works and how these diseases kind of impact them. Um, so um, just to get started, um, let's see. So um, today's uh, Schreier Family Vision Scholar Lecture is supported by a generous gift from Nancy and Mark Schreier, and we're grateful for their support for this lecture series. Uh, the planning committee have no financial relationships to disclose. Um, uh, and the objectives for today's talk, um, hopefully by the end of today, you should be able to describe how Parkinson's disease impacts the basal ganglia and dopaminergic circuits, um, evaluate evidence for or against one theoretical hypothesis about how Parkinson's disease impacts behavior, uh, and summarize an experimental approach being taken to improve our understanding of Parkinson's. All right, so let's sort of dive in here. Um, and I'll start by just giving a brief summary or overview of Parkinson's disease. Um, as most of you are familiar with, it's a well-known neurodegenerative disorder. It affects roughly about 1 million people in the United States. Um, and typically it tends to affect older individuals. So people tend to get diagnosed in their like, 40s or 50s or even later than that. Um, and for some reason, men are, tend to uh, be diagnosed with Parkinson's disease more frequently than women. I don't think it's really well understood why exactly that is. Um, and whenever we think about Parkinson's disease, we usually tend to think of sort of the characteristic symptoms associated with it, which tend to be a rusting tremor um, and akinesia or um, bradykinesia, slow movement slowing or hypokinesia, 
you know, sort of minimization of movements. Um, and so here in this video, um, you can see a let's see, you can see a person with Parkinson's disease. You can see that they you can see both of these symptoms playing playing out here. Um, so you see a resting tremor in their right hand. Um, their left hand, they're being asked to make open and closing movements with their fingers. Um, their left hand was a little bit slow, but their right hand, again, as you can see, is much slower than still. Um, and so this person is really affected primarily on their right side. And Parkinson's disease does tend to be um, lateralized, particularly earlier in the disease course. Um, and the primary symptoms of this disease are really attributed to um, loss of dopaminergic neurons in the basal ganglia. Um, um, as I mentioned, some of the primary symptoms are um, bradykinesia or movement slowing, rigidity, and resting tremor. Um, but there are also a whole host of non-motor symptoms that also come along uh, with this disorder. Um, things like apathy, depression, um, cognitive problems like having problems multitasking or having impulsivity, um, memory problems, psychosis, um, autonomic dysfunctions like um, gastroenterology, uh, GI regulation, and sleep problems. Um, and in fact, in some people, these non-motor symptoms are actually more prevalent than the motor ones. Um, but in any case, we really would like to be able to understand why these symptoms are appearing and how they relate to the dopaminergic system in the basal ganglia. Um, so what do we know so far? Um, so most of our understanding of this circuit um, is, or we have a pretty good understanding of um, to the basal ganglia from a pure circuit level um, model. And so we understand a lot about sort of the interconnections of what's happening in the basal ganglia. I mean, this has led us to kind of speculate about how um, information flows through this region of the brain. Um, and there's a very classic model that has been proposed. Um, anyone who's studied neuroscience has probably heard about this model. Um, and it basically proposes that there are two primary loops that pass through the basal ganglia. There's what's called the direct pathway. Um, and um, usually this is, these pathways are discussed in terms of the motor system. Um, so starting from motor cortex, you enter through the striatum of the basal ganglia and you pass through uh, an inhibitory circuit, which inhibits the thalamus and that feeds back up to motor cortex. And so um, this direct pathway is a disinhibitory pathway, or it, in other words, it helps to facilitate movement. Um, and then there's a second pathway through the basal ganglia, which is the indirect pathway. Um, and this has an additional inhibitory connection in it. And so this serves to inhibit movement overall. Um, and it's thought that sort of the balance between the direct pathway and the indirect pathway um, are really what sort of regulates our behavior. Um, more recently, there's also been recognized that there's a, an additional so-called hyperdirect pathway. Um, this has largely been attributed to sort of a global suppression of movement. Um, so it's been um, assigned roles like inhibiting movements before movement onset. So we really make sure that any planning that happens doesn't spill over accidentally before we're ready to begin. Um, and um, dopamine um, is actually a regulator of this pathway. Um, and so its normal function is to excite the direct pathway. So again, it tends to upregulate movement. Um, and inhibits the indirect pathway. So it suppresses the inhibition. And I really apologize. It's really hard to talk about this circuit without getting tangled in too many inhibit inhibitory terms. So um, if I will always try to sort of explain, I will try to avoid using this inhibition because that gets really confusing. Um, in any case, um, so the the classic model 
in explaining what happens in Parkinson's disease is that because of loss of this dopaminergic signal into the striatum, you actually get a decrease in the direct pathway and an increase in the indirect pathway. Um, and that tends to overall uh, is thought to inhibit or reduce movement outcome. Um, so this is sort of the classic model. It's very much a motor control model. Um, it is heavily biased in terms of thinking about regulation of movement. Um, but we also know that the basal ganglia does a lot more than just motor control. Um, and so it is now well recognized that you have this you know, well-known loop through the sensory motor and premotor cortex, uh, but there are also additional loops that connect other regions of uh, cortex to the basal ganglia. Um, and each of these has been assigned sort of distinct functional roles. So there are sort of more cognitive loops that tend to be associated with things like you know, the impulsivity or um, cognitive control, uh, memory, that sort of thing. And then there are sort of these limbic circuit loops that tend to be associated more with emotional regulation and so on. Um, and so the idea is that if we take sort of that classic model that we talked about on the previous slide and just sort of replicate it into all of these additional loops, then um, we can really kind of explain all these symptoms as being sort of a function of this dysregulation of this circuit that is supposed to kind of maintain some balance in each of these um, systems. Uh, and so are the typical Parkinson in system uh, symptoms that we see really tend to reflect the degree to which these various loops are affected. Um, and because in general, the sensory motor loop is the one that tends to be most affected, that's why we tend to see mostly motor symptoms in this disorder. Um, okay. So what about dopamine? So dopamine is most commonly associated with signaling reward prediction errors. Um, and so- I ask, yeah. I ask a question here? Yes. So the role of dopamine um, that you describe in the sensory motor uh, or the motor circuit, mm -hmm. dopamine plays similar role in other circuits as well, right? Yeah. Or yeah. is it, yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, so, so that's a really good point. Um, what's really kind of funny is the things that we, you know, part of the reason why I titled the talk the way I did is because the sort of our under, our common sort of thinking about a lot of these things tends to be sort of sort of picked from various aspects of this circuit. Um, so like I said previously, really when we think about what's going on in the basal ganglia, we always tend to fall back on the motor circuit in terms of thinking about the direct and indirect pathway. Um, when we think about dopamine, we tend to think about its role in the cognitive circuit and we tend to think about reward. Um, and so I, I'll get to this a little bit later, but that tends to be problematic when you try to put it all together. Um, in any case, like I was saying, um, the common idea here with dopamine is that it's associated with signaling reward prediction errors. Um, and so the idea is that if you are expecting a reward and it doesn't come, then dopamine will signal that. Um, also, if you're not expecting a reward and it does come, then dopamine will signal that as well. Um, and so early in learning, the idea is that if you you, know, you have a stimulus and you are trying to figure out how to respond to it. If you do the right thing, then you get a reward. It's unexpected and you and the dopamine system really likes it. And so it will respond to that, that reward. Um, but later in learning, once you've learned to anticipate that these rewards should be coming, then dopamine tends to signal in response to the stimulus. Um, so you see the stimulus and dopamine says, I expect a reward now because I know what I should be doing in response to that. 
um, and you so you actually see the the signal, the dopaminergic signal, um, actually uh, stop occurring after the reward itself is given and start occurring just before the stimulus happens, or just after the stimulus happens. Um, there's also some effects attributed to tonic dopamine, which is sort of the long run rate of dopamine that just sort of spontaneously exists in the system. Um, this has been associated with things like response vigor or motivation, just sort of more global parameters um, in the circuit. All right, so um, just to kind of quickly sum up here. So the basic English circuit um, when you, is thought to sort of be associated with regulating movement. And so when this gets disrupted, this, the idea is that this increases inhibition of the cortical thalamic pathway, um, and that tends to reduce the likelihood of producing voluntary movement. Um, and similarly, the dopamine system is thought to respond to reward. And so when you lose that signal, then you tend to get a reduction in your response to reward. Um, and this has been associated with reducing sort of the vigor of responding because your reward signal has been impaired. Um, and also the reduction in the ability to learn in response to reward. Um, and so things like the ability to form habits tends is thought to be suppressed. So that's sort of where we are in our understanding. Um, we have a really good understanding, like I said, of the cellular and circuit um, of these structures. Um, we have these sort of speculations about the behavior and how these circuits relate to that behavior. Um, but these are a little less clear because like I was mentioning to Shalish, we've sort of picked and chosen the bits that we are interested in of these various models and put them together to try to explain how, how behavior fits together. Um, the other thing to remind people of is that much of what we know about dopamine and basal ganglia comes from studies of animals, um, in particular mice and rats, but people are not really a good, or mice and rats aren't necessarily the best model for the way that people's brains work. Um, I'll give you a very nice concrete example. Um, so this is a study that was done in um, 2015, and the, they were looking at how rats learn um, stereotypical skilled behaviors. Um, and so what they did was they taught these rats essentially this particular behavior. The rats could perform it in a very stereotypic fashion. So they built up this habit of this behavior. Um, and then they, basically took out the rat's motor cortex. Now, if you are a person and you lose, you lose your motor cortex, you are basically not going to move anywhere. Um, in contrast, what we can see is that um, this is the behavior before the, the motor cortex was removed. This is the behavior after. There is basically no change. Um, and so what these authors um, claimed is that the ability to perform this habitual behavior was really dependent upon um, the basal ganglia circuit, an intact basal ganglia circuit. But I, um, as I mentioned, I think if we try to then translate that idea into people, while it may be true that the basal ganglia is involved in this process of habit formation, it's it can't be, the circuit can't work in exactly the same way. Um, otherwise, we would all be perfectly fine after a stroke to the motor cortex. Um, all right. The other problem is that you can't ask a, a, an animal why it did something. So um, we make a lot of assumptions that behaviors are um, occurring because they are you know, because these rodents have learned a habit, but you can't really ask a, a rat or a mouse, why did you actually do that thing? Was it really habitual or were you, were you trying to voluntarily do that for some reason? 
Um, so we have to really take a lot of this research with a grain of salt. Um, and then, it, um, and so like I said, it's unclear whether some of the functionality that's described to the basal ganglia in these um, rat and mouse studies is really also true in people. Um, the other thing to kind of point out is that we really don't have a single theory to explain all of our um, motor impairments in Parkinson's disease, especially when it comes to these theories of behavior. Um, so let me explain what I mean here. So again, here is the sort of list of, of symptoms that tend to be associated with Parkinson's disease. Um, and we can think about sort of the hypothesized reason for why these behaviors might occur. Um, and so if we pick and choose a little bit, we can say, well, bradykinesia and fatigue and you know, sort of depression, maybe these kinds of things arise from an effort reward trade-off. Right. So now we're really thinking about the role of dopamine and what exactly it's doing in sort of invigorating our movement and making us move better. Um, but that kind of idea doesn't really fit with I, some of these other symptoms. We can also pick a couple other symptoms so we can think about, again, bradykinesia, but now we can pair that with you know, impulsivity and we can start to think about voluntary versus habitual trade-offs in behavior. Um, you know, if, if you suppress the voluntary system, you sort of unleash or sort of release these habitual behaviors, um, or maybe you create a habit formation problem. Um, and so this really fits with that idea of that you've overly inhibited cortex. But it, you know, again, this is a completely different hypothesis for to try to explain these symptoms. Um, and then you also end up with completely mechanistic, non-behavioral hypotheses, like the idea of resting tremor, for example, is, is, is attributed to unstable oscillations in the basal ganglia circuit because you no longer have this proper balance of the direct and the indirect pathway. Um, but that's a purely mechanistic hypothesis, and it doesn't really help us think about any other behavior and what, this, what the role of the circuit is in that behavior. Um, and so it's it's really difficult to kind of reconcile all of these things together. All right, so um, another, so a couple of other big caveats here. Um, one thing is that we often study, if we do study Parkinson's disease and the disruptions caused by Parkinson's disease in basic anglia, um, we tend to study this in patients who are being treated for their disorder, um, often with dopaminergic medications. Uh, dopaminergic medications can themselves cause motor and behavioral problems. Um, and so sometimes it's not clear if we're actually studying the effect of the disease or the effect of the treatment. Um, and this is borne out by the fact that a lot of times people report no difference between testing participants on versus off their medication, um, which theoretically shouldn't happen if we really understand how this circuit works. Um, as I mentioned before, we rely on heavily on animal models um, to infer our theoretical understanding of, the, of these circuits. Um, and finally, the other point to note is that it's not just dopamine that's involved. There are other neurotransmitters like serotonin, which none of these theories think about or touch on, or, and in fact, we often don't even, we don't even treat some of these problems, um, at least in the clinic. So just some caveats to kind of think about. All right, so now I'm gonna kind of get into the meat of the, of what we're, trying to study in the lab, which is we're trying to unpack, we really, really, what we really want to do is unpack some of these theories and kind of probe them a little bit more deeply. Um, so I'm gonna talk about two in particular today. Hopefully I'll get to the second one. Um, the first is you know, this question of what exactly is going on in the dopaminergic circuit. Um, to, uh, and does Parkinson sort of change that um, effort reward balance? Um, and um, as I mentioned, this is 
sort of a prevalent model of what's, uh, what's driving bradykinesia. So we really would like to drill down into there and find out where, you know, if we can understand this relationship a bit better. Um, the second one is another very commonly um, discussed theory, which is that um, the basic ganglia is supposed to be really important for habit formation. Um, and so we'd like to unpack a little bit, does Parkinson's disease actually affect the learning and expression of habitual behavior or not? All right. Um, so we'll start with this first one. Um, and this is uh, work that is largely being done by my research assistant, Luke Carter. Um, and what we really want to take a look at here is um, this idea that dopamine is thought to mediate reward and movement vigor. Um, and in fact, the idea is that dopamine signals reward or something associated with reward. Um, and you need that signal to offset the cost of moving. Um, movement itself you know, takes some amount of um, resources. It's, you don't just kind of get to move for free. And the brain really wants to sort of minimize the cost of, you know, whether that be metabolic cost or something else of moving. Um, and so something has to kind of pay that cost Otherwise, we would tend to all just sit around and do nothing all day. Um, and so the idea is that dopamine sort of helps to, to, um, to signal rewards, and rewards are the thing that, that offsets the cost of movement. Um, and so um, bradykinesia is thought to arise from some disruption of this effort-reward equation. Um, but we don't really know, we don't really have a clear understanding of what exactly is being disrupted in that equation. Um, one thing in particular is, as I sort of alluded to, different regions of the basal ganglia are associated with signaling reward or movement vigor. And so if reward and vigor are supposed to be the things that are traded off, they um, that doesn't really quite make sense from a circuit standpoint. Um, and so we think that it's probably one or the other, at least for most people, unless their disease has progressed to the point where it's impacting the entire basal ganglia. Um, and so what we wanted to find out is which part or parts of the effort reward relationship are being disrupted in Parkinson's disease. Um, and sort of here are the options. We could be disrupting our sensitivity to reward, right? Um, and so we just perhaps are less motivated in general to do things. Um, we could be disrupting our sense of effort or our willingness to exert effort to move. Um, and this can be done, and this is sort of in a reward-free sense. So um, the idea there is that uh, the you know, dopamine and the basic ganglia circuit are really just invigorating behavior. Um, or it could be somewhere in between. So it could be in the relationship between reward and effort without impacting either of those two things. Um, and again, if there's more than one thing affected, are those actually related in some way? All right, so what's the evidence for or against these alternatives? Um, so there is some speculation that um, Parkinson's disease disrupts reward signaling. Um, there has been some work that has suggested that people are less sensitive to changes in um, different levels of reward uh, compared to, um, to different levels of effort. Um, and so the idea is that um, that sort of decrease in sensitivity has driven is is why um, the you know bradykinesia occurs. Um, there's also been some work suggesting that um, patients with Parkinson's disease are impaired at associating visual stimuli with rewards. So they, um, but but they can associate visual stimuli with different effort costs. And so again, the idea is that 
it could it's the reward side of the equation that's gone wrong. Um, and there's also been some work showing that at the very basic level, um, people with Parkinson's disease just don't respond to rewards in the same way that um, that neurotypicals do. Um, and as a signal of that, if you look at sort of the pupillary response or you know the sort of involuntary dilation of your pupil in response to seeing something that you is very rewarding, um, those signals seem to be suppressed in people with Parkinson's. Um, on the flip side, there's been a lot of work showing that people with Parkinson's disease just tend to move more slowly. Um, they're less willing to exert effort, even though they could. Um, and the idea there is that this may be because that, you know, that movement is appears or seems more effortful than it really should be. Um, in fact, it's been reported that people with Parkinson's disease tend to perceive activities of daily living as more effortful than compared to neurotypical individuals. All right, um, and so what we'd like to do is sort of systematically measure how people with Parkinson's disease respond to effort and reward. Um, and test this within a single group of individuals. So no one before has looked at both sides of the equation in the same cohort of people um, to really try to sort this out. Um, we also want to test people on versus off their medication to look at the impact of um, dopamine. Um, and we're gonna compare behavior against a group of age-matched neurotypical controls. Um, I should mention that this study is one that we are currently running. So we've currently tested six participants with Parkinson's disease. Um, they have been tested both on and off their medication, and we have um, five neurotypical controls. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the actual study, um, parts of the study that we're running, um, and also um, show you a little bit of this preliminary data and see if we can make any headway, or at least make some predictions about what we might expect. All right, um, and so what would we expect? Um, depend and so if the, there is a disruption in reward sensitivity, um, then if we, if we looked at reward sensitivity, obviously we should expect to see an impairment there. Um, if we tested, if we looked at any impairments in movement vigor, we should expect that we wouldn't see an impairment if, again, this is purely a disruption of reward sensitivity. Um, and if we looked at sort of the effort reward balance, we might see an indirect impact there, but it would really be primarily driven by the reward sensitivity. Um, if instead, we've disrupted the effort side of the equation, um, then we would expect to see no change in behavior when we test for a difference in reward sensitivity. We would expect to see a decline in movement bigger, um, and again, an indirect effect when we look at this reward effort balance. Um, and if we looked at the reward effort, if the disruption is to the reward effort relationship itself, then we would only expect to see an impact at that level. All right. So um, like I said, we're going to go in and test for people's sensitivity to reward, their um, sensitivity to effort, um, and the reward effort balance, and see where disruptions arise. All right. So we'll start with looking at people's sensitivity to effort. Um, so we had people perform an isometric force matching test. Um, so they were being asked to push against a, a, a robot that was matching the forces exerted by them. So they weren't actually moving anywhere. Um, and we asked them to match, um, to try to report their forces that they were perceiving. So the way we did this is we showed them a stimulus on the screen. And we said, I want you to flex your tricep until you fill up that bar. And so the harder people were flexing, the further up um, this little display would go until they reached some level of force. Um, and so that allowed us to visually cue people 
to produce forces of different levels. Um, then we had people stop flexing, so they relaxed. Um, and then we asked them to reproduce the exact same level of force um, without any visual information. Um, and so the idea here is that if people are impaired at their perception of effort or their ability to produce effort, then they should produce less effort um, in the repeat phase or the matching phase because they perceive that that's F, that they perceive their exertion to be more effortful than it really is. Um, and then at the end, we asked them to rate how effortful that was perceptually um, on a scale from zero to 10. All right. um, so on a single trial, um, what you can see here plotted is the amount of force that the person was exerting um, over time. Um, and so as that initial prompt is displayed to exert some level of force, um, you can see that people are able to exert that level of force um, and then they're told to relax. And so that force level drops back down to zero. Um, and then we ask them to match that force. Um, and in this case, this person actually uh, exerted more force than they needed to um, uh, in order to match what they were been asked to do. Um, and then they relaxed again at the end of the trial. And so what we can do is we can compare the amount of force they produce in the match to the initial force um, and look at that uh, difference. Uh, yeah, Shalish? So do you tell them at the beginning, I think we've talked about this, but I don't remember. Do you tell them at the beginning that you're generating this force and then you will be required to retrieve the same amount of force afterwards yes okay so there yes. is there is a component of mm, sort of memory of this there it is but we we train people on how to do this um so they get a lot of practice trials and we sort of step them through initially they get i think they get um to practice with the visual stimulus um, and then we take it away at, at some point okay. on the match track so they understand that they should be reproducing what they felt before. Okay. Aaron, I might just jump in while, sorry, while you had the interruption. Yeah. Um, just sort of stepping back really quickly to the, the overall sort of theory. So you presented the, the circuitry at the start that's, that showed a, um, you know, some, some circuit level evidence for why we might have um, this bradykinesia, or it seemed like a simple explanation. The, the favorite hypothesis would be they just need more, it needs to be scaled up, they need more effort to, to get moving again. So I'm just wondering, and you'll probably address that, but I was thinking that as well as it's mainly in gait, these things, but you're studying the upper extremity. So is there evidence that it's a similar, I guess you showed that with the finger tapping exercise, it is, it's present in the upper extremity. I've just answered my own question. And then the isometric versus dynamic. So um, most of those UPDRS things, I think are dynamic or are they isometric as well? So would you expect that perhaps if you could just address that last question? Yeah, so, is... um, so we chose to do isometric for a few reasons, um, but you know, generally the, you would expect that the, if people are sort of bradykinetic, that they would both have a slow isometric, a slowed contraction isometric yeah. as well as yeah. moving. I think so. The, it would be the same sort of muscle contraction in both ways. Yeah, that, that same effort of contracting an agonist is, is if there wasn't a, something blocking it that would lead to a, should lead to a movement. I think that that's fair. Yeah. Thanks, Aaron. Okay. Uh, were there any other questions? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm still struggling with the effort, effort production and this task. Like, what, how do you know that it's not, you know, their ability to reproduce that effort versus it's the, or reproduce the force versus effort. 
and how the, how I be related? Right. I, I was I was uh, thinking about the same issue, but but I think uh, Aaron, you have a second measure, which is the subjective rating of the effort, because it's not it's not clear to me that we would need to assume in inaccurate perception of effort as opposed to a steeper effort function and I don't choose to deliver as much effort most of the time as you would like me to, but I might be accurate about it. So, but that'll come out in your second measure, right? Okay, that's right. That, that, is, that, is, that is cool. Yeah, yeah and, um, and I agree that we, you know, we're sort of agnostic to which of those is true, John. Um, so, so it could be sort of just that your perception of how much effort you should exert is blunted. It could be that you just, you actually don't exert as much effort. Um, and just to sort of, I guess, give you the punchline, the people's perceptions of effort are well correlated with what they actually do. Um, so it doesn't look like it's a perception problem per se, um, but there is an, a problem with um, actually producing effort as request. Um, okay, great. Uh, and so what we do with this uh, with this data here is we we um, compare the force that you are producing when you're asked to match to the initial force. So that gives us a sense of how well you can reproduce this force, um, and that's what we're going to plot here on the y-axis. Um, and then on the x-axis, we plot sort of different levels of force for this person. Um, and as you can see, there tends to be sort of a decline um, as the force increases. That's not surprising because, you know, as you are asked to press further and uh, push more and more, you, you're going to be inclined to not push as hard. Um, and also at the beginning, there is a tendency to sort of overestimate the amount of force that you really need to produce. Um, and so what we can do is we can quantify two parts of this uh, plot. We can quantify the offset or sort of the global shift in how much force you're willing to exert compared to how much you're really being asked to. Um, and so the, the larger this offset, the more force you're producing uh, and then the second feature of this is the slope, or how quickly does that does the force you produce fall off as the force level you're being asked to produce increase? Right. Okay. Um, and so here's a little bit of uh, preliminary data from this. Um, so what we see is that um, so first of all, controls are very noisy. I will admit that we need a lot more of them. Um, but what you can sort of see on average is that um, patients tend to be a little bit less willing to produce forces. Um, so if you compare the offset, they tend to produce lower forces overall, or at least they tend to be closer to the, the bottom of where controls are. Um, and if we look at sort of the slope, um, that slope actually tends to be flatter. So that it, people tend to um, not fall off quite as much, but I think that's because they're also starting lower. Um, and so if you take these sort of two pieces of um, data together, it seems to suggest that there's, there may be a sort of reduction in effort production in these participants. Um, what's interesting is if you look at their behavior when you take them off their medication, um, that, actually, oh, there it is. that actually tends to um, exaggerate those findings. And so people tend to, again, exert even less effort overall. Um, and their sensitivity to that effort change tends to be even lower. Um, and so um, we also see analogous findings if people are asked to match using their other arm. So it's not, it's not, it's something sort of higher level than just, well, I'm going to sort of match that fatigue. It's really, you know, trying to match that sensation of force. Um, and so these data seem to suggest, like I said, that part, people with Parkinson's may be impaired on their ability to produce effort. Aaron, this is fascinating. The, yeah. the, but but I, I, here, here's something which I'm thinking about. So we know in healthy controls, as you increase the amount of force, mm -hmm. oh, before that, how long are they holding that? 
force up there? Like, so when you exert force, how long are they holding it up there? So the, the match phase is, um, I believe it's four seconds, five seconds, something like that. And we basically take the sort of average behavior across that. Okay, so I'm thinking when, especially with isometric forces, we know that um, even when you exert forces at higher, sort of higher force levels, um, there is a great amount of variability even within that block. Have you looked at variability in controls versus Parkinson's disease? So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about, um, so is, it, is it that variability out there that is driving some of these results? Um, that's a good question. We haven't specifically quantified variability yet, um, but in variability, you know, that does raise a really other, uh, another interesting point in this data set, which is that our patients are surprisingly consistent. And that is not, that is yeah. not different than postural control studies in Parkinson's disease. So you yeah. see that the center of mass in, uh, sorry, center of um, pressure in uh, controls is pretty much all over the place, mm -hmm. but Parkinson's, it's very limited. So they have limited repertoire but even within that repertoire, they might be more variable. Right, right. Um, I just found it really, so I agree, we, we do, we will want to go back and look at variability within an individual person, um, but it does, it, I guess it surprises me how, how much less variability there is in the Parkinson's population, even though yeah, yeah. they have a large range of, UPDRS scores. So there's yes. you know, a range of severity here. So I think you should look at some postural control work in this day. Okay. This, is, this is, when I first saw this, I was, um, that was what first came to my mind. Okay. But this is wonderful data. Thanks. Thanks. All right, um, so just kind of going a little bit more quickly through the rest of this. Um, so we also ex asked people about their reward sensitivity. Um, so essentially we gave people a choice. We said, would you prefer a fixed amount of money or to make a gamble? Um, and the idea here is that um, the willingness to accept this gamble tells us a bit about how much you value that fixed amount of money. So the more you're willing to gamble, the less you value this money and so on and so forth. Um, and so what we can do is we can plot the choice of choosing a gamble as a function of the difference between the value of the fixed amount of money or the gamble. Um, and so that gives us a plot that looks like this. Um, and we can fit in a line to it and then estimate what we call the indifference point or the point at which you're equally willing to choose the gamble or the, the bet or, or the fixed amount of money. Um, and this point tells us about essentially how much you value that amount of money, right? So, the further to the right or the larger this indifference point is, the, um, the more we have to offer you in the gamble to, in order for you to accept um, that. Uh, okay. um, right. And so if we look at again at patients versus controls, we actually see no difference here um, between what the sort of sensitivity to reward that uh, patients exhibit compared to controls. Um, and if we look at them off their medication, again, we see surprisingly no difference. Um, and so what this seems to suggest to us is that there's, there's no impairment on the reward side of the equation, or at least we don't, we're not seeing anything. Um, and so, so far what our data seems to suggest is that it's really sitting on the effort side of the equation where there's a problem. Um, and just to kind of quickly reiterate that, we can also test sort of the effort reward relationship. Um, and so what we can do is we can ask, we can give people effort reward pairs. And so we could say, for example, would you be willing to exert 50% effort for a 20 cent reward? Um, would you be willing to exert 80% effort for a 5% reward? And we can look at whether people are willing to accept or reject performing these various options. 
And that will, would allow us to calculate sort of the relationship between you know, how much effort are you willing to exert for reward or what's that effort reward balance. Um, and so I will just sort of step through this um, quickly for lack of time um, and just say that we have a way then to extract that effort reward relationship. Um, and so if we take a look at what's going on, um, interestingly, we don't see much of an impairment um, in that effort re reward relationship for um, uh, patients with Parkinson's disease, um, but we do see an impact of medication. So this relationship tends to shift um, and get less sensitive over time or with when people are off their med medication. Um, and it shifts in the direction of a reduced sensitivity to effort. So again, this seems to really suggest that there is, there's a problem on the effort side of the real equation here. Um, right, okay. Um, so just to quickly sort of summarize, um, we see that uh, people with Parkinson's disease seem to be affected in their effort or effort perception um, uh, without any impact on the reward sensitivity. Um, and dopaminergic medication seems to partially restore this effort sensitivity. Um, okay, uh, for the sake of timing, I think I will uh, not go into the second part of this talk other than to say that we are also actively investigating this idea that Parkinson's disease may be um, related to habit formation. Um, and we really, um, at least some initial preliminary data, um, which is done in collaboration with some of our colleagues down at Johns Hopkins, seems to suggest that people with Parkinson's disease can form habits, so they don't have a habit formation problem. Um, but we have yet to um, investigate whether this ability to form habits is impaired relative to controls or maybe even or the alternative could be that it might even be stronger relative to controls. Um, there's some evidence on the literature to suggest it might go that way as well. All right, um, so I will sort of skip through this here. And sorry that this question's there. Uh, yep. Thanks very much, Aaron. I know you're trying to be uh, as conscious of everyone's time. I think uh, John White had a question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, or are you going through your conclusions? Yeah, maybe I'll just say my conclusions really quickly and then we can go to questions. Um, and so what I really hope you kind of took away from today's talk is that um, the role of the basal ganglia and dopamine in behavior seems to be a bit less clear than we really think it should be. Um, and in fact, it's still somewhat contradictory according to the literature that's out there. Um, a lot of research uh, we, we need to have more research that involves people with Parkinson's disease um, that can really help us get insight into these problems. We need to really, um, as I mentioned before, a lot of the work currently is in animal models. And while those are really helpful to, in terms of thinking about the actual circuitry and being able to measure dopamine um, and um, you know, give us sort of a more controlled lesion case, uh, they, they can't give us a full picture. And so we really need to, to study people. Um, and um, ultimately we hope that this would allow us to better understand current rehabilitation approaches. Um, so you know, one common one that's used often is LSVT, or, um, which is this idea that people are trained to think, you know, make bigger movements, exert more effort, um, and maybe we can understand why if we realize, you know, if we are able to see that there is really an, a problem on the effort side of the equation. Um, and if that's true, or are there ways that we can sort of think about that uh, fact and use that to help us make these treatments even more effective? Um, so just to kind of end here, um, I just want to acknowledge um, the team of people that are really doing a lot of this work. So um, in particular, my research assistants, Luke, um, our collaborators um, and our funding sources. So thank you for your time.
Wonderful, thanks, Aaron. Uh, in the last couple of minutes, uh, I think we probably have time for one question to just be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, John White. Um, yeah, Aaron, very interesting. Um, I, I'm struggling a little bit with the effort part. Um, if it's effort perception, that seems like it's fairly straightforward to study with the sort of matching technique or other things like that. But, but if it's the production of effort, not the perception of effort, I'm having trouble with the what's the cart and what's the horse. That is, if you uh, if you cause my muscles to become fifty percent weaker than normal, and now ask me to do the same task, it will be more effortful. So, how do we disentangle whether uh, whether I am perceiving the inefficiency of my motor system when I tell you about effort versus I have a problem in generating effort. Maybe it's that I everything in my life is so much more effortful than it should be that I just can't really deliver that level of effort all day long. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, you know, uh, one thing we uh, we're doing is again we're trying to collect these self-reported perceptions of effort, um, which would help us, I think, to kind of start to address that issue. Um, you know, thinking back on, on the, the underlying hypothesis, um, the idea is really that the basal ganglia are involved in some sort of like invigoration um, circuit, um, kind of like pressing a gas pedal. Um, and so it's, the idea is like, other regions of your brain also for actually planning the movement and then the basic thing that kind of say, this is how fast or how much effort you want to be used to actually produce it. Um, and so I think in that sense, um, you know, what our data seem to be suggesting is that um, that gas pedal is sort of broken or it's, it's faulty. So we're, we're not, people, people with Parkinson's disease are just not um, sort of ramping up that effort level to the same degree. Um, and the, you know, there's sort of two, there's, there's sort of two pieces of evidence that um, I presented. One is that you know, the overall offset of effort level has gone down. So across the board, these individuals are just willing to produce less effort and say, that's good enough. You know, that's what I think I was asked to do before. Um, um, and then again, the sort of sensitivity or how quickly that falls off as the effort, uh, the requested effort increases, that also has sort of flattened out. Um, and so this sort of, again, suggests that there's this little bit of reduction of sensitivity to changes in the level of effort being asked. Yeah, now I would just say, I mean, of course, this is based on very few subjects yet, uh, and so mm -hmm. it, we might have a more refined sense of the, the slopes and stuff with more data, but I mean, given that healthy people deliver less effort the more you ask them to do, if a Parkinson's patient's whole life is exerting more effort than usual, then you might expect that to translate into a lower, in, into an offset thing not just a drop off at high levels of effort, if you get what I'm saying. In other um, words, the, the, the reduction would happen at a, or at a lower effort point for a Parkinson's patients if everything is a struggle. Folks, okay. I might uh, just let people drop off as they need to get back to their clinical um, uh, obligations, et cetera. Uh, feel free, I guess, to hang around if you would like to a little longer uh, with Dr. Wong. Thank you so much, Aaron, for your uh, comprehensive lecture today. This is really exciting work. So if you'd like to hang around, if you got a few moments, Aaron, in case anyone wants to stick around. Great yeah, to no, see uh, the client family here. Thanks so much, uh, Judy and Peter. So if you need to drop off, please feel free to do so. Thanks once again, and a virtual clap for, for Aaron. <laughs> um. Yeah, John, that's a really um, interesting question. I think, you know, again, I, I would kind of point to what we see in our data that it seems like at least sort of systematically when you take people off their medication that everything drops. Yeah, yeah, that's probably the most, that'll be m more interpretable maybe within the within subject chains than the yeah. 
across. Yeah, great. Yeah. Thanks.